Appendix Lamed The Tactics of Magic The human brain evidently operates on some variation of the famous principle enunciated in The Hunting of the Snark. What I tell you three times is true. Norbert Wiener, Cybernetics the most important idea in the Book of Sacred Magic of Abra Malin the Mage is the simple-looking formula, Invoke Often. The most successful form of treatment for so-called mental disorders, the behaviour therapy of Pavlov, Skinner, Wolpe et al., could well be summarised in two similar words, Reinforce Often. Reinforcement, for all practical purposes, means the same as the layman's term reward. The essence of behaviour therapy is rewarding desired behaviour. The behaviour, as if by magic, begins to occur more and more often as the rewards continue. Advertising, as everybody knows, is based on the axiom repeat often. Those who think they are materialists and think that materialism requires them to deny all facts which do not square with their definition of matter, are loath to admit the well-documented and extensive list of individuals who have been cured of serious maladies by that very vulgar and absurd form of magic known as Christian science. Nonetheless, the reader who wants to understand this classic work of immortal literature will have to analyse its deepest meanings guided by an awareness that there is no essential difference between magic, behaviour therapy, advertising and Christian science. All of them can be condensed into Abra Melin's simple invoke often. Reality, as Simon Moon says, is thermoplastic, not thermosetting. It is not quite silly putty, as Mr. Paul Krasner once claimed, but it is much closer to silly putty than we generally realise. If you are told often enough that Budweiser is the king of beers, Budweiser will eventually taste somewhat better, perhaps a great deal better, than it tasted before this magic spell was cast. If a behaviour therapist in the pay of the communists rewards you every time you repeat a communist slogan, you will repeat it more often and begin to slide imperceptibly toward the same kind of belief that Christian scientists have for their mantras. And if a Christian scientist tells himself every day that his ulcer is going away, the ulcer will disappear more rapidly than it would have had he not subjected himself to this homemade advertising campaign. Finally, if a magician invokes the great god Pan often enough, the great god Pan will appear. The opposite and reciprocal of invoke often is banish often. The magician wishing for a manifestation of Pan will not only invoke Pan directly and verbally, create Pan-like conditions in his temple, he will also banish other gods verbally, banish them by removing their associated furnitures and colours and perfumes. The basic Christian science mantra, known as the scientific statement of being no less, is as follows. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God and man is his image and likeness. Therefore man is not material, he is spiritual. The fact that these statements are, in terms of the scientific criteria, meaningless, non-operational and footless is actually totally irrelevant. They work. Try them and see. As Alistair Crowley, no friend of Mrs. Eddy's, wrote, Enough of because! May he be damned for a dog! If you are afraid that you might, in this Christian environment, fall into taking the Christian science mantra too seriously, try instead the following simple experiment. For forty days, 
and forty nights. Begin each day by invoking and praising the world in itself as an expression of the Egyptian deities. Recite at dawn, I bless Ra, the fierce sun burning bright. I bless Isis Luna in the night. I bless the air, the Horus Hawk. I bless the earth on which I walk. Repeat at moonrise. Continue for the full forty days and forty nights. We say without any reservations that, at a minimum, you will feel happier and more at home in this part of the galaxy. If the results are exceptionally good, you just might start believing in ancient Egyptian gods. further offences and affronts to the rationalist in the deeper study of magic. We all know, for instance, that words are only arbitrary conventions, with no intrinsic connection to the things they symbolise. Yet magic involves the use of words in a manner that seems to imply that some such connection or even identity actually exists. The reader might analyse some powerful bits of language, not generally considered magical, and he will find something of the key. For instance, the 2 plus 3 pattern in Hail Eris, All Hail Discordia, is not unlike the 2 plus 3 in Holy Mary, Mother of God, 
or that in the LS MFT, which once sold many cartons of cigarettes to our parents, and the 2 plus 3 in Crowley's EO Pan, EO Pan Pan, is a relative of these. Thus, when a magician says that you must shout Abrahadabra and no other word at the most intensely emotional moment in an invocation, he exaggerates. You may substitute other words, but you will abort the result if you depart too far from the five-beat pattern of Abrahadabra. A glance at the end of Appendix Beth will save the reader from misunderstanding the true tenor of these remarks. Now this brings us to the magical theory of reality. Mahatma Guru Sri Paramahansa Shivaji, Alistair Crowley again under another pen name, writes in Yoga for Yahoos, Let us consider a piece of cheese. We say that this has certain qualities, shape, structure, colour, solidity, weight, taste, smell, consistency and the rest. But investigation has shown that this is all illusory. Where are these qualities? Not in the cheese, for different observers give quite different accounts of it. Not in ourselves, for we do not perceive them in the absence of the cheese. What then are these qualities of which we are so sure? They would not exist without our brain. They would not exist without the cheese. They are the results of the union, that is, of the yoga, of the seer and scene, of subject and object. There is nothing here with which a modern physicist could quarrel, and this is the magical theory of the universe. The magician assumes that sensed reality the panorama of impressions monitored by the senses and collated by the brain is radically different from so-called objective reality. About the latter reality, we can only form speculations or theories which, if we are very careful and subtle, will not contradict either logic or the reports of the senses. This lack of contradiction is rare. Some conflicts between theory and logic, or between theory and sense data, are not discovered for centuries. For example, the wandering of Mercury away from the Newtonian calculation of its orbit. And even when achieved, lack of contradiction is proof only that the theory is not totally false. It is never, in any case, proof that the theory is totally true. For an indefinite number of such theories can be constructed from the known data at any time. For instance, the geometries of Euclid, of Gauss and Riemann, of Lobachevsky and of Fuller all work well enough on the surface of the Earth, and it is not yet clear whether the Gauss-Riemann or the Fuller system works better in interstellar space. If we have this much freedom in choosing our theories about objective reality, we have even more liberty in deciphering the given or transactional sensed reality. Everybody, of course, does this unconsciously. See the paragraph about the cheese. A magician, doing it consciously, controls it. This book, being part of the only serious conspiracy it describes, that is, part of Operation Mindfuck, has programmed the readers in ways that he or she will not understand for a period of months, or perhaps years. When that understanding is achieved, the real import of this appendix, and of the equation 5 equals 6, will be clearer.